We want to welcome you all back. We hope you had a great group discussion tonight. We are discussing Acts chapter 6 and 7, the diaconal order. So we've been talking about the body of Christ is mirrored in the mystical body of Christ, the bride of Christ, the church. And so the light we're seeing in the book of Acts, the life of Christ is recapitulated in the life of the early church. And tonight, we see in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, the Hellenist murmured against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Can you imagine? Humans are murmuring. <laughs> murmur, murmur, murmur. The Greek widows are being neglected in the daily food distribution. And there are murmurings going on. This is dissension within the mystical body of Christ. And it started last week when we saw Ananias and Sapphira. They had let Satan enter their heart, and they had lied against the Holy Spirit. And we saw that initial dissension, and now we have murmuring. Murmuring, murmuring. Grumble, 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 grumble. A murmur in the Greek is a secret debate. So it's behind your back debate. A secret displeasure not openly vowed. A grudging, a grumbling. Grumble, 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 grumble. We hear it all throughout the Bible, all the way through the Exodus in the Old Testament. The Israelites are grumbling. You're, they're grum this is all you have to feed us? Just this bread from heaven? Food of angels, that's it? I mean, <laughs> grumble, 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 grumble. And all through numbers, grumbling, grumbling, grumbling. And even in Jesus' time, when he told them to eat my flesh, drink my blood, they grumbled. And he said, stop grumbling among yourselves. Stop murmuring. Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? Eat my flesh, drink my blood. Why are these new Christians grumbling and mum murmuring? Because the Greek Christian widows are getting neglected in the daily distribution. And the Hebrew widows are getting more. Why? Many Hellenists, Greek-speaking, were Jews from the diaspora. So after the Babylonian exile, they had returned and they had repatriated to Jerusalem for religious reasons. But it was the custom for Jews from the diaspora to return to Jerusalem in their old age in the land of their ancestors to die there in the city of David. The men wanted to die in the city of David. They'd go there to die, leaving their widow destitute with nowhere to go. And the surviving widow needs food. And if she has children, the children are fatherless. They become orphans. So the Jewish Christians who were dis Bursting the food were accused of favoring the local Aramaic Hebrew-speaking widows that always lived here instead of the Greek ones that were coming in and couldn't speak the language as well. So you see the pastoral problem they're faced with. God has always, always, always had compassion for widows. Laws of the Torah gave special attention to the care of widows. In Deuteronomy 14, it says, the fatherless and the widows who live in your towns may come and eat and be satisfied so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. God wanted the widows cared for. He was a father to the fatherless. A defender of widows is God in his holy dwelling. And the social responsibility toward the widows, do not take advantage of the widow or the fatherless. If you do, says the Lord, and they cry out to me, I will certainly hear their cry. My anger will be aroused, and I will kill you with the sword. Then your wives will become widows, and your children will become fatherless. So God cares for widows. The last prophet, Malachi, said, So I will come. In the day of the Lord, I will come to put you on trial. I will be quick to testify against sorcerers, adulterers, perjurers, against those who defraud laborers and their wages, and those who oppress the widows or the orphans. In Luke 4, when Jesus opens that scroll in Nazareth and reads Isaiah 61, and they feel that the power, the Spirit of the Lord is upon him, and they know it's being fulfilled in their midst, and they are amazed. And then Jesus goes on to preach, and he says that he's not accepted in his hometown. I assure you, there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years, and there was a severe famine throughout the land, yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, to none of the... Israeli widows, he was sent to Zarephath in the region of Sidon. <gasps> they
they hate Sidon. The Sidon widows are being cared for instead of the Israeli willows, widows. And at the end of that chapter, they want to push Jesus off the cliff. They've had it by the end of that chapter. So he also warned them. He warned the teachers of the law, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin. He said, beware of the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces. They have the most important seats in the synagogue and the places of honor at the banquets. They devour widows, their houses, and they make a show with lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. So God has a heart for widows. Jesus, in the New Testament scriptures, will love the widows. He will have compassion for them. The first one Luke tells us about is old Anna, age 84. And she had lived with her husband seven years in marriage, and then he died. And she was a widow until she was 84. And all day, every day, she spent in the temple waiting for Messiah, praying. Jesus um, also loved this widow in Luke 21. As Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury, and then he saw this poor widow. She had two small copper coins, the widow with two mites, and he said, truly I tell you, the poor widow has put in more than all the others. All the other people gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had to live on. So why does the new mystical body of Christ care so much about widows? Because it's recapitulating the life of Christ, and he cared so deeply about widows. And the life of Christ is being recapitulated in the mystical body, the church. Now, to be a widow in that day was not an easy life. And widows were poor, and they had to depend on others to survive. And if you had young children... That was hard, but you were lucky because those children can grow up and maybe support you one day. But if you have no children, then you're really in trouble. You're especially destitute if you have no son especially. So when Jesus saw his mother at the foot of the the cross and the disciple who he loved standing near his mother, he said, woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. He knows she's going to become a widow soon. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. Mary is now a widow with no son. And there's a lot of layers to that. But that's often used as an apologetic to show that Mary had no other sons. Or why was Jesus giving her to Zebedee's son, John? And Joseph must have been deceased. Because why wasn't Joseph there? So anyway, Jesus loves widows. My mom is a widow, and, and we asked her before, Mom, will you ever get married? And she says, Jesus is her bridegroom now. Jesus is her spouse. So I think a lot of widows know that you fall in love with Christ in a new way as a widow, and he's your all now. So um, there is one story I have to point out because it's by St. Luke, who's full of the Holy Spirit and who loves Mary. And only Luke tells us about the widow of Nain, And it's a miraculous resurrection story. You would have thought all the guys would have covered it, but only Luke. And here it is. Soon afterwards, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went with him. And as he approached the gate of the town, a man who had died was being carried out. He was his mother's only son, and she was a widow. And with her was a large crowd from town. Now, he's young. That means she's going to be a widow for a long time. She's going to be destitute for a long time and need people to care for her. And the Lord saw her, and he had compassion for her, and he said to her, Do not weep. And he came forward, touched the buyer, and the bearer stood still, and he said, Young man, I say to you, rise. The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized all of them, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has looked favorably upon his own people. So, why would only St. Luke record this? It's a fabulous resurrection miracle. But I think St. Luke knows Mary. He had interviewed Mary for the infancy narratives. He's the only one that has the story of Mary. And I think for Mary... This will be an especially encouraging miracle when her own son dies and she is left a widow. 
because Nazareth and Nain are only nine miles apart. Nazareth is uphill, it looks down on Nain. Mary from Nazareth could have looked down and seen the village of Nain. Mary has only one son, the widow of Nain has only one son. Mary's son has died, the widow's son has died. A large crowd is ensuing, a large crowd is ensuing. Mary too will be left a widow, her only son will die, but her only son will also rise like the widow of Nain's son. This will be an encouragement for Mary to remember at the foot of the cross and on Holy Saturday while he's in the tomb and everyone thinks it's over. Mary would have remembered this miracle and maybe she reported it to Luke herself as she did the infancy narratives. This miracle must have been a great encouragement for this new widow, Mary. A miraculous resurrection story, St. Luke full of the Holy Spirit. We know he loved Mary. He painted Mary icons. And Christ has compassion on his own mother as he does for all widows. And so uh, one last point about this. When the Lord saw that widow of Nain, he had compassion on her and he said, weep not. And when he, it, it just reminded me at the foot of the cross when he looks down at Mary and has compassion on her and says, weep not. It's not over, Mom. I'm going to rise on the third day. Remember, I told you that all those times. Mary, do not weep. It's not over. Your son, too, like the widow of Nain's son, will rise again. So on that day of quiet, that Saturday, Mary prays and waits and remembers possibly this miracle of the widow of Nain, and he does rise on the third day. And the other interesting thing about this is the word compassion, because in the Greek, it's a verb. Compassion is an action word. It's a verb. And it means to be moved as to one's bowels. And I'm like, what? Hence, to be moved with compassion. <laughs> to have compassion, because the bowels were thought to be the seat of love and pity. And to be moved is a verb. And when you're moved, you have to do something about it. <laughs> and so it's an action verb. So when Jesus is moved with compassion for this widow, he has to do something about it, and he raises him from the dead. It makes sense, perfect sense. Does this story move you? Jesus is moved with compassion for widows. The mystical body of Christ will be moved with compassion for widows. And so the 12 summon the body of disciples and they say, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Are they dissing on tables? Are they putting down table service? I see some yeses and some noes. No. Because Jesus himself in Luke 22, 27 said, For which is the greater, the one who sits at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who sits at the table? But I am among you as the one who serves. And when he was washing their feet at the Last Supper, he said, What am I doing? You don't know now, but later you will understand. Afterwards, it will all make sense. The greatest ones are those who serve. <laughs> the lowest will be exalted. Service is highly esteemed. This is a ministry of charity, a ministry of love. And they are growing as a community, and they're learning to discern their spiritual gifting. And Paul will write about this to the Corinthians when he says, Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are a variety of working, but it is the same God who inspires them in all, in every one. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So the early church is figuring out their gifting. And as it grows, the hierarchical organization is forming. So Peter and the other apostles are preaching the word of God. And they um, pick out among yourselves, they say, seven men of good repute, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. Those are the qualifications. Seven, the number of perfection. St. Bede writes that seven deacons who would be of higher rank than the others and who would stand closer around the altar like the columns of the altar, there being seven in number is not without some symbolism. Also, they were to be men of good repute. They must have a good reputation. And Timothy 1, uh, Timothy 3 says that deacons likewise must be serious. I know we have deacons in here. Not double-tongued, not indulging in much wine, not greedy for money. They must hold fast to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience 
and let them be first to be tested. Then, if they prove themselves blameless, let them serve as deacons. Also, let deacons be married only once, and let them manage their children and their households well. Ooh. That's a hard one. Manage your children well, deacons. <laughs> for those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and great boldness in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. So they must be full of the Holy Spirit. They must be full of wisdom, which is a fruit of, a gift of the Holy Spirit. And in Hebrew, it's a feminine noun. They must have understanding and good discernment. In Greek, it's Sophia wisdom. It's also feminine. It means broad and full intelligence with knowledge of very diverse matters. Deacons will have to handle a lot of pastoral issues. And they will need skill in the management of affairs of the church. The 12 apostles need some help. The church is growing its time. And the Holy Spirit inspires them. And they say, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. If these deacons help with these pastoral issues, then we can devote ourselves to prayer. I'm so glad they said prayer first. First, they must pray so that they can do the ministry of the word. Prayer is always first before the ministry of the word. And John 15, they remembered that because he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. So they have to take their nourishment from the vine first, from Jesus Christ in the Eucharist, in the wine, in the bread, his body and blood. And so seven are chosen. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. Those friends are all Greek names. All seven that they chose are Greek deacons because it is the Greek widows that are being neglected and it is the Greek speaking deacons that can minister to their pastoral needs. And these, they said before the apostles, they prayed and laid their hands upon them. The apostles did. So this is an apostolic succession with prayer and laying on of hands. Same today. In Numbers 8, this was nothing new. Consecration and service of the Levitical priests. When you present the Levites before the Lord, the people of Israel shall lay their hands upon the Levites. The laying on of hands and praying. And when Jesus called each apostle, all 12 by name, in correspondence, in praying first to the Father, who should it be getting the 12, and laying hands on them and anointing them, ordaining them, praying for them, to be the new priesthood that would have authority from Christ to ordain others. This is apostolic succession with apostolic authority. In an unbroken chain of succession, we can trace it all the way back to Peter. And they will lay hands on and they will pray, and it's still done like this today. In fact, Bishop, Bishop James Conley from Lincoln Diocese lays hands and prays on men to ordain them in the diaconate. This was in Archdiocese of Denver. This was one of his last things before he moved to Nebraska. But he said, I'm not going to say too much in my sermon because this ceremony, this holy orders, is going to tell you so much. Just listen to, the, to the, the service. But in the Jeremiah reading, it said, be not afraid, the Lord is with you. And he expanded on that, and I have to read it. He says to the deacons, be not afraid to preach the full Catholic truth, the full gospel of Jesus Christ on the dignity of the human person, on the gift of human sexuality, and on the call to justice and religious liberty. The message is, be not afraid, the Lord is with you. You, my brothers, are being ordained to a noble ministry with a great tradition, a ministry of service a ministry of charity, a ministry of preaching the gospel paved before you by the martyrs who preach the word of God in good times and in bad. The bishop continued, be faithful to the call and be fearless in the face of persecution. Like Stephen tonight, the diaconate. Ordination comes from the Latin word odoratio, which means to incorporate someone into an order. And there's three levels, the episcopate, the priesthood, and the diaconate. And it, it uh, mirrors the old priesthood, but it's different. So the high priest was Aaron, now it's Jesus Christ. 
Aaron's sons versus the Episcopate, the apostles, the bishops, the 72 elders, the priesthood, the Levites, the deacons. The Eastern Church always maintained deacons. The Western Church um, slacked, uh, uh, surrendered that for a while, but after Vatican II, permanent diaconate was reestablished in the West, and married men are allowed to become permanent deacons. And the word of God increased, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. These are Levitical priests are being obedient. They're being drawn into the new covenant, and they're believing it, and they're following with obedience, and the church is growing. Luke continues to tell us the church is growing and growing. And Stephen, full of grace, full of grace and power, did wonders, great wonders and signs among the people. Stephen is full of grace, but they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he spoke. Mary, the spouse of the Holy Spirit, full of grace also. Jesus, full of grace and truth. They could not withstand the wisdom with which he spoke. Stephen, full of grace. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, it was called, the Cyrenians, the Alexandrians, Cilicia, Asia, they disputed with Stephen. Many synagogues are in Jerusalem at this time. Peter's preaching outside the temple. Stephen goes to the synagogues to spread the gospel, especially to the Greek-speaking synagogues. And they secretly instigated men who said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes. And they came before him and seized him and brought him in before the council and set up false witnesses who said, this man never ceases to speak words against the holy place, the temple, and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place, the temple, and he will change the customs which Moses delivered to us. So they are blaspheming against Stephen sounds very similar to when Jesus went before the council, the same council. Stephen will go before the council. In Jesus' life, many false witnesses came forward. At last, two fellows came forward and said, this fellow, Jesus, I'm, he said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said, have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify about you? Now, is that really what Jesus said? that I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. What he really said in John 2, Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it up in three days? But he spoke of the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. But Jesus was silent to the charge, and the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said to him, you have said so, but I tell you hereafter, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Does that sound like what Stephen saw? And the high priest tore his robes and he said, he's uttered blasphemy. Why do we still need witnesses? You've heard the blasphemy. What is your judgment? And they answered, he deserves death. They spat at him, struck him, slapped him, prophesy. Blasphemy. The charge goes way back to Leviticus 24. If you blaspheme, you should be stoned to death, says the Lord. Stephen will be stoned to death. Jesus Christ is taken outside the city walls and crucified, and even worse, more gruesome death. Cursed is he who is hanging on a tree outside the city wall of Jerusalem. He who blasphemes the name of the Lord shall be put to death. Now, is Stephen guilty of blasphemy? No. Just like Jesus, he was not guilty of blasphemy. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. I thought, where else in scripture do we see anyone with the face of an angel? One place is in the Greek Septuagint, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
go into the fiery furnace. And it is recorded that they had the face as like that of an angel. When we see the face of an angel, what's an angel's job? It's a messenger from God. And so when someone speaks with the face of an angel, they are a direct messenger from God. And that's what Stephen was, full of the Holy Spirit. He delivers the longest speech in the entire book of Acts. Now, I want to, like, look at the big picture of that speech instead of all the details of salvation history, which we'd be here for a long time. So the main question of that speech that Stephen is getting at theologically is this. Are the new messianic Christ followers renegade Jews or... Do they have legitimate claim to call themselves the authentic realization of the people of God? That's what he's going to try to address. Are these renegade Jews, or are they authentically the realization of the plan of God for his people? So Stephen in this speech is developing a Christian apologetic. St. Paul's going to do a similar thing when he speaks with the Galatians and the Romans. Those will be um, Christian apologetic letters of Paul. This is Stephen's. He's going to have three main characters, Abraham, Joseph, and Moses. Let's start with Abraham, as Stephen does. In the story, the way Stephen tells it of Abraham, God is by far the main actor. God is not just the father of the Jews. God is the father of all mankind, all people. It is all God. Everything depends on God. God appears. God speaks. God moves. God grants an inheritance. God promises. God judges. God gives a covenant to Abraham. He tells him to look at the stars. You'll have that many descendants. As many as the sands and the stars. Abraham believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. When he reaffirms the covenant in Genesis 15, the sun's going down, and God puts Abraham into a deep sleep. So Abraham's not even awake, and God alone passes through the split animals. And the blood of the new of this old covenant, a new covenant to Abraham. God alone passes through with a smoking pot and a torch. Abraham's asleep. It's all dependent on God. Abraham's going to blow it a lot of times, especially when he sleeps with Hagar, the maidservant, and has a child, Ishmael. Abraham's not going to do everything right. But God is going to do everything right. This is dependent on God's promise. This is what Stephen is trying to emphasize. God's actions, not Abraham's. God's promises are emphasized. God's promises will be fulfilled, but at a much, 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 much later date. A date that is now, in Stephen's time. Through Jesus Christ, the Messiah who has risen from the dead. Then Stephen's going to speak about Joseph. I love this one. Stephen demonstrates a typology of Joseph. Joseph is a type of Jesus, a prefigurement of Jesus. How? Joseph is rejected by his very own brothers. Jesus will be rejected by his very own brethren Jews. Joseph will become a slave. Christ Jesus, who was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. Dulos, a slave. Joseph is sold for 20 pieces of silver by his very own brothers. Jesus is sold for 30 pieces of silver by his very own brother, Judas, one he called to himself, one of the 12, one of the inner circle. The brothers lied to their father Jacob, telling him that his favorite son is dead. Everyone through thought that Jesus, God's favorite son, was dead. The son's fate is reversed by God. Joseph's fate is reversed by God. Joseph is eventually installed as the viceroy of Egypt. He's second in command only to Pharaoh. 
the fate of Jesus is reversed by God. He too is second in command, obedient to the Father in all things, seated at the right hand of the Father, second only to the Father in command. Joseph is at the right hand of Pharaoh. Jesus is at the right hand of God. Joseph's own brothers are starving for bread. It's a famine. They're going to die. They're starving for bread. Jesus' own brothers, the Jewish race, are starving for bread. Only Joseph has grain in Egypt that can save them from death. Only Jesus has grain that can save them from death. Unless a grain of wheat falls, it's just a grain. But if it falls and dies, it becomes many, 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 many loaves of bread. Bread to feed the world like a perpetual offering of bread that can become the Eucharistic bread. His own brothers did not recognize Joseph at first. When they come for the grain, they don't know who he is. They do not recognize Joseph, his own brothers. <laughs> Later they come to recognize him. Joseph forgives his brothers. Incredible story of forgiveness after all they had done to him. That woundedness is healed and forgiven. Jesus' own Jewish brothers don't recognize him at first. He's preaching in the temple like no one they've ever heard. They are amazed. They are astonished. It's a 12-year-old kid. His own brethren don't recognize him later. Some do. Some don't. They kill him. And Jesus forgives them. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. My own brothers. He is the new temple, Jesus Christ. He is the new bread of the presence, the grain, the bread. It's not just in the temple, in the Holy of Holies anymore. Destroy this temple. And I will build it in three days. And the temple he's talking about it is his body. And then he breaks his body and shares it with the world in this new bread of the presence. The temple he's talking about is his body. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. This new bread that he will offer is called the bread of the presence in the temple. In the Holy of Holies, they had to keep a table and it had to have 12 loaves of bread on it at all times. And it was called the bread of the presence. And it was in the holiest place in the temple, in the Holy of Holies. And the priest changed out the loaves every day. 12, one for each tribe of Israel. And it's called the bread of the presence. Jesus Christ is the temple. He is the new bread of the presence. And it's for all men. And it's because of God's love for us. Once a year, once a year, the rabbis would take this table out to the crowd, hold up the table with the shoe bread, with the bread of the presence, and say to the people, Behold God's love for you. With this bread of the presence. <laughs> Behold God's love for you. Once a year. Now Jesus is the temple. His body's been broken and shared. He is the bread of the presence. Behold his love for you. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven to forgive our sins and to become our eternal food, the true tree of life, the eternal bread from heaven. Now Joseph died and is buried and his body is still in a grave to this day. And when you go to the Holy Land, you can go into the West Bank and see Joseph's tomb in Shechem. And Steve and I visited there, and it was one place where I was feeling unsettled inside. It's always been a place of violence, Joseph's tomb. Jesus died and was buried, but his body rose, and he sits at the right hand of the Father in the true promised land of heaven. And Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, as a direct messenger with that face of an angel from God, sees it all. And he's telling them, you guys, it's not here at the temple. This isn't it. This Jesus. The next one he's going to talk about is Moses. Moses is the major portion of his speech. And we've been doing some Moses typology. Jesus Christ is the new Moses. I won't go a lot into Moses. 
But I do like this. The first time Moses comes to his people, Moses is not recognized. He uh, kills an Egyptian for an injustice against a Hebrew. He has to flee to Midian in the second 40 years of his life. And then for 40 years, he's doing the desert wanderings. But in that first 40 years, when he realizes the Hebrews are his own brethren, and he saw two Hebrews fighting, and he said to the one uh, he killed, he, he saw, a, um, I'm sorry, he saw an Egyptian mistreating a Hebrew slave, and he killed the Egyptian. And, and uh, he saw two Hebrews fighting, and he said to the one who was in the wrong, why do you strike your fellow Hebrew? And they answered him, who made you ruler and judge over us? Because they don't realize that Moses is their brethren, and he is their deliverer. Who made you Lord over us? Well, God did, <laughs> but they don't know that yet because they don't recognize it. And in the next 40 years, Moses calls, uh, God calls Moses to that burning bush, and it's a theophany. It's that unconsumable bush like the tree of life. It won't be consumed by the flames of the fire, the Holy Spirit, and it's God's voice. So all three in the Trinity are lining up to self-disclose the name of Yahweh to Moses. I am who I am. Go save my people. Go deliver my people. They don't recognize him. <laughs> Moses will deliver them from bondage. He will take them through the waters of death, the baptismal waters of the Red Sea. But this grumbling generation will not make it to the promised land. They won't make it there. They're going to wander around for 40 years in the desert, grumbling, grumble, 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 grumble. Only two will make it. Moses doesn't even make it. Moses does everything he possibly can to get them to the promised land. God sent Moses to redeem and deliver his people, but they don't recognize him as their redeemer and deliverer. They aren't obedient to him. They grumble, 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 grumble against Moses and against God. Now, as wonderful as Moses is, he is no Yeshua. Because Joshua's next. Yeshua, God saves. It's Jesus. Yeshua is God saves. God is salvation. And it's the new Yeshua, Jesus, who will make them and us, who is going to take us back to the Father, to the true promised land. The true promised land is not here. The true promised land is here. In light of Christ's resurrection, his ascension back to the right hand of the Father, his pouring out of the Holy Spirit, Stephen is telling them, you guys, Sanhedrin, council, Pharisees, the temple is your national institute. You're so proud of it. It's taken you so many years to build. You put so much money into it. It's a whole temple system. Stephen says, doesn't matter. It, it's not, he doesn't stress the temple. It's not the temple. The temple is going to be destroyed in 70 AD. The new temple is the body of Jesus Christ, and he's risen from the dead. Jesus and his Holy Spirit is dwelling in a new temple. We can have that as individuals. You can be a temple of the Holy Spirit as a collectively as a church. We are a temple of the Holy Spirit in this mystical body of Christ, the church. So Stephen's saying, do you guys want this temple? Or do you want to be a living temple full of the Holy Spirit of the living Christ? What do you want? And then they don't want it. And he says, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you are forever opposing the Holy Spirit, just as your ancestors used to do. Which of the prophets did your ancestors not persecute? This is not boding well for Stephen, because Jeremiah suffered martyrdom by stoning. The prophet. The prophet Ezekiel suffered martyrdom in the land of the Chaldeans. The prophet Micah suffered martyrdom. The prophet Amos was tortured the, and suffered martyrdom. Zechariah was killed near the altar of the temple of the holy, holy God. And Isaiah suffered martyrdom by being sawn in two. It's also recorded in the book of Hebrews. John the Baptist, who just came to you, the most recent prophet, you beheaded for a dinner party favor. You stiff-necked people, you will always resist the Holy Spirit. You will always kill the prophets. 
They killed those who foretold the coming of the righteous one, and now you've become his betrayers and his murderers. You are the ones that received the law as ordained by angels, and yet you have not kept it. You killed God. And so did I. And so did you, and you, and you, and you. We killed God. We didn't recognize him. But he still wants you to recognize him. Stephen's telling them he still wants you to know who he is. You have another chance. He wants to offer you eternal life. You didn't recognize the prefigurements of the Messiah, and you didn't recognize him. You didn't recognize Jesus. God showed his face to you, and you didn't recognize him. This temple, this is just a temple. This is just a thing. The temple is the eternal temple of God. And Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father. This promised land that he gave us, this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful promised land, it's just land. And he appeared to Abraham and Ur. He appeared to Joseph in Egypt. He appeared to Moses and Midian. They weren't even in the promised land. This land is land. The promised land is in heaven with God. Repent. Believe. It's him. Recognize him. Sanhedrin, come on. You stone-faced people. By the power of the Holy Spirit, I will pour it out on all people. I will give my spirit to everyone. Everyone. Even to the widows of Sidon and Tyre and Egypt and Assyria and Syria and Iraq and Iran and everyone, even those people in the United States of America. All the families of the earth. First thing he told Abraham, God said it. All the families of the earth will be blessed through your seed, Abraham. All the nations, all the families of the world. And they are enraged because their hearts are so hardened. Some came to believe, but others went deeper into their hard-heartedness. And when they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth against Stephen. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, behold, behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. He's giving this gift of a consolation from the Trinity when he looks up and sees, come on, come on, Stephen, keep telling him, keep speaking my spirit. Come on, come on, Stephen. I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out in a loud voice and stopped their ears, and they rushed together upon him. And they cast him out of the city, and they stoned him. And they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul, who we will meet in two chapters, Acts 9. And while they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Just as Jesus had cried out in a loud voice on the cross, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And Stephen, then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he died. Echoing Jesus, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. Stephen is killed by stoning for blasphemy. Jesus is killed by crucifixion for blasphemy. Both are full of the Holy Spirit. Both are full of God's grace and the spirit of truth. St. Stephen the martyr gave his own life that others might recognize Christ. Don't be the one who doesn't recognize him as your Lord and Savior. Don't be the one who doesn't recognize Christ as your Lord and Savior. And just listen to these final words, and these are words of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to take a little liberty and put Stephen in here. And it's from John 15, the world's hatred. If the world hates you, Stephen, be aware that it hated me before it hated you. If you belong to the world, Stephen, the world would love you as its own. But you do not belong to the world, Stephen. I have chosen you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. But remember, Stephen, remember the word that I said to you. Servants are not greater than their master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they kept my words, they will keep yours also. 
but they will do all these things to you on account of my name, Stephen, because they do not know him who sent me. Don't be the one who doesn't recognize him as your Lord and Savior. Stephen gave his life for that. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Through the intercession of St. Stephen the Martyr, we ask for that same bold courage and wisdom of the Holy Spirit that filled you, St. Stephen. We ask to be the kind of witness that you were, to be willing to be persecuted, even to the point of death if we have to, so that others might recognize Jesus Christ alive in us, through us. We pray for the church, that it might be full of the Holy Spirit and be a bold mouthpiece for the world, a bold witness in charity, in love, in grace. And we ask our mother's intercession, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Stephen the Martyr, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.